Hey, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Your Owners. We meet every Saturday at 9 a.m. Central Time. If you're watching this on YouTube, LinkedIn, or Facebook Live, welcome to the show. Hey, you uh, YouTube subscribers, you're killing it out there. We're up to 853. Remember, we got that goal to hit 1,000. You're going to help me do it, I'm sure. This is your first time watching the show. Um, uh, be sure to check out our website at euronurse.com where you can learn more about the show. It's also the very very best place to go to watch all of our past episodes, 69 of them so far. Also, if you're not getting our newsletter, please uh, go to the website and sign up for the newsletter quick and easy, and you'll get uh, it delivered to your house every Monday in your email. So also, if you've got a question for the show, the comment box is always available. Put them in anytime you want. We're glad to take your questions. Want to listen to us in your car? No problem. We have our audio podcast. Just go to our Euro Nurse Plus area and it'll take you to all your favorite places to find podcasts and you can sign up on any of those. We are still helping out uh, Suna with this um, survey that they're doing. So go ahead and if you're a, a registered nurse and a Suna member, go ahead and click on that QR code or scan that QR code with your phone or go to our website and click on it. It'll bring you right to the survey. It's painless, takes only about five minutes to fill that out. We have a great show this week. We have Dr. Rachel Rubin joining us, who's going to speak to us about the genital urinary symptoms of menopause. So we're looking forward to that one. Let's go ahead and bring in all of our experts right now. Experts, here we go. I think we got you all here. And welcome to the show, everybody. Morning. So uh, really pleased to have everybody joining us today. It's going to be a great show. I think it's always fun to have all the experts. John, you snuck in there at the last minute. I just saw you clicking in there. <laughs> I sure did. So I'll kick it off with my introduction. My name is Vic Sinise. I'm the host and producer of the show. And I started this as a way to give back to the profession, a profession I've been involved with for 40 years and love and still love so enjoy it it's uh always been a great time and great experience uh, i always find that i'm always learning something new and exciting on the show and that's what's the fun part of it so be sure to put in any comments or questions you have and you can put those in ahead of time because i do see some coming in throughout the week i have got one i'm going to share later on after the show with uh, the audience so let's bring in Lori. Lori, go ahead and give us your introduction morning. My name is Lori Atkinson. I'm a certified urology registered nurse. I have been in urology for 25 years, currently working for Northwestern Medicine in Geneva in Winfield, Illinois. Very happy to be here. And like Vic said, I learn a ton of, of this. I mean, I share my experience, but boy, do I learn a lot. Thank yeah, you. Absolutely. And John, how are you doing today? Well, I'm hailing from Las Vegas. I'll be on stage in a couple of hours presenting on coding, billing, and how to run your practices better. My name is John Lynn. I'm typically hailing from Gilbert, Arizona, which is a suburb of Phoenix. I'm a pri private practice urologist. I'm so fortunate in that I now get to share my clinical and business knowledge among my peers to help everyone. To that end, one of the ways I'm doing that is through the Thriving Urology Practice Facebook group where we crowdsource practice management solutions for everyone's benefit. Unfortunately, I will not be able to stay for the entire duration of your nurse, but I will be listening to the episode live. I figured if I made the introduction <laughs> to Vic, uh, Dr. Rubin's introduction to Rick, I, I definitely should show up for the uh, beginning of the show. Back to yeah. you, Vic. Great, great. Glad to have you on. And Lace, go ahead and introduce yourself. Hi, good morning, everyone. I'm Lace Heideman. I'm a uh, registered nurse, certified in urology, have been a nurse for over 10 years, and most of those have spent in urology. Really happy to be here. Um, and as Lori mentioned, even though we all can share a little bit of our experience, we all learn a lot um, and really love to be a part of this. So yeah. thank you for having me. Ah, great. Gl always glad to have everybody on board. And now today, our special guest speaker is Dr. Rachel Rubin. Go ahead and introduce yourself and then we'll bring up your slides. 
Hi, y'all. I'm Dr. Rachel Rubin. I might be vice president, at least secretary of the Dr. John Lynn fan club. So I think that might be <laughs> the most important introduction I can make. Uh, I am a urologist, but I have fellowship training in sexual medicine. And I started my own private practice about two years ago in the Washington, D.C. area. And I have a cash pay practice where I spend a lot of time with people. Uh, you can't do sexual medicine in 10 minutes or less when you got 50 patients a day. You can try, but it's really uh, challenging to do it. So so I do things a little bit differently. I bring people in. I spend a lot of time with them. I really go into that biopsychosocial approach. I take care of men and women, really all this stuff. Those patients you all know that just take a long time. That's my jam. That's Those are the patients I love uh, to see. So um, I'm just thrilled. I'm so thrilled to be here. And um, actually, what an incredibly important group of people to be talking to today. Great, great. Glad to have you on board. And go ahead and take it away. So um uh, it's so exciting now. You know, I, I'm going to try to do this in about 20 minutes. I want you all to know that I could give this talk for hours and hours and hours. Um, I want to talk today about something that is so very important for urology nurses to understand, because I believe that each of you can actually change the whole world. You have the potential of saving our healthcare system billions of dollars. You have the potential of saving individual lives, and you actually have the potential of saving many marriages, families, and keeping people like living their best quality of life and happy. And I'm going to explain how you as a urology nurse actually can do this. And I'm not even being a little bit I, like this is very true. So um, I really recommend you all follow me on social media. It's at Dr. Rachel Rubin. It's up there on that in the right uh, side of the slide, not because I want more followers, but because many of the doctors that you work with, many of the PAs and nurse practitioners that you work with, they may know this stuff, but they don't know it as forcefully as you're going to teach them. And so um, I like uh, I like to give uh, information about sexual medicine in really short short clips and short videos and short articles and short blog posts so that you can learn, you can learn quickly, and you can change your medical practice. That's kind of the thing that I love doing because sexual medicine is actually really important for a urology clinic, as you all know, because we're dealing with genitals all day long and uh, we don't always ask the questions that we should be asking, but these are the things our patients really, really care about. Now, I want to give a little disclosure here um, that I am uh, the current educator education chair of a really cool society called ISWISH, which is the International Society for the Study of Women's Sexual Health. We love nurses. We love doctors. We love physical therapists and sex therapists. It's a really multidisciplinary organization where we teach people as much as there is to know uh, about women's sexual health in particular. And so we have an annual meeting coming up in Long Beach uh, in February. We'd love to see you there. Uh, and then our fall course, which Dr. Lynn comes to every year because it's in Scottsdale, um, um, this It's already passed, but of course, it'll be next year. It's sold out every year, and you should absolutely use your CME dollars uh, to come and check it out. And so um, I just want to start with, with saying thank you. Thank you for what you all do every day. Thank you. Uh, just from the bottom of my heart, uh, these patients, if you're tuning into this either live on a Saturday morning or you're watching this, you're an incredible uh, nurse. You're an incredible clinician. Uh, you genuinely care about your patients, and they are just so incredibly lucky to have you. So from the bottom of my heart, thank you. As you know, we can always learn more, right? Uh, my colleagues learned how to operate with a robot, uh, so they can certainly learn how to treat women who have recurrent urinary tract infections, or what you're going to learn about is called genitourinary syndrome of menopause. Now, it is um, no shock to anyone who works in urology that we take care of everybody. We take care of all genders, right? We take care of every genital that comes through the door. It's just that we don't always know exactly how to take care of women. We're not as good sometimes at taking care of our female patients as we are our male patients. And um, not everybody needs a urogynecologist for prolapse and incontinence. We all see those recurrent urinary tract infection patients. And the gender bias is real. We all know it. We know there's a pay gap. We know there's a gender gap. And, and it, it really, it, it digs deep. It goes even in, right, um, even in our advertisements. So this is an advertisement, you know, for the hint 
Kim's uh, on the right side, all the ED drugs that are out there. You all know this stuff. It was in the New York City subway. Everywhere was plastered, these penis ads, uh, and it was no problem. And when this female-owned vibrator company tried to put an advertisement that said 91% of men get where they're going, while 60% of women don't, right? Talking about the orgasm gap, that men orgasm more frequently than women. Uh, the New York City subway system said, you can't run that ad in our subway. That's disgusting, right? And there was lawsuits, right? Because one ad is allowed and the other is not. And so it's really problematic because we, we don't talk about women's sexual health the same way we talk about men's sexual health. And these issues actually are not just about sex. It's actually about urinary tract infections and saving lives uh, from and preventing urinary tract infections. But we all know what this is, right? We all know what Viagra is. Um, and it changed the world. In 1998, it changed the whole world. It changed many of your lives as well. Uh, uh, I mean, in the urology practice, of course. Um, but, but Viagra, we've had female Viagra actually long before we've had male Viagra. It's just nobody ever told you. No one ever explained it to you. And it hasn't been marketed correctly. And I'm going to explain how vaginal hormones, so vaginal estrogen or vaginal DHEA, is actually Viagra. Why? What does Viagra and Cialis do? They are muscle relaxers. They relax the penis muscles to allow more blood to flow in to, to create that erection. Well, so they help with erection. They help, you know, obviously if you have a better erection, they may help a little with orgasm. That may boost your libido a little bit. Well, we also use Cialis for BPH, right? Five milligrams daily Cialis is approved for BPH. So it helps with urinary issues and sexual function. Well, vaginal hormones help with urinary symptoms, help with sexual function, and also prevent urinary tract infections. Now, Cialis, as far as I know, has never been proven to prevent urinary tract infections, but you're talking about a drug for women that has been around since the 1970s. So in the 1970s, we got Premarin cream, which is not my favorite choice to give to people. Uh, so if, you, if that's the only move that you have, we're going to work on other moves to give you. And since the 1970s, we've had a number of different products for vaginal hormones. And so vaginal hormones are female Viagra, which were around since the 70s. That's long before 1998. It's just that we don't talk to women about this. We don't explain it. And so no one gives it to women. In fact, less than 6% of women are given the choice of vaginal hormones. It's often the gynecologist that has to give it. But this is actually a urology medicine for a urology problem and should be urologists at the forefront screaming and yelling about vaginal hormones. And when y'all start following me on social media, you will get uh, lots of information and you will start screaming loudly at cocktail parties and on the subway system about why everyone needs vaginal hormones. So let's talk about it for a second, right? Menopause uh, is, is really a urology problem. We think of menopause as just hot flashes and night sweats. Oh, let the gynecologist deal with all of that. But those, the hot flashes often go away. The urology symptoms, not only do they not go away, but they clog up your inbox. How many UTI uh, uh, messages are you getting, my on-call doctors, this Saturday morning? Uh, how many people are you rounding on because they have urosepsis and a two millimeter stone that they want to consult you on to see if that stone is causing the urinary tract infections? So menopause is actually a huge urologic problem that we must do a better job of talking about. So why should you care? Well, if you're listening and you are a woman who plans on being alive after 50, um, if you care about a woman who plans on being alive after 50, or if you take care of men, so you only do men's health, you only take care of men, but you care about men who care about women who plan on being alive after 50. That's why you should care about this. It's really, really, really important. And so it's so important that we yell a lot on Twitter about this. If you follow me or my amazing co-fellow, Ashley Winter, we we were co fellows together, uh, which is so amazing. Uh, we scream about this on social media because it is, we can, it's not just one patient in the exam room that I can reach, but I can reach thousands and thousands of people. I took this screenshot uh, kind of a couple of years ago, but in my opinion, in Twitter thread, it goes into everything you need to know about genitourinary syndrome of menopause. It's still there today, so please check it out. And it's a long thread that has had hundreds of thousands of people read it. My friend Ashley Winter, Dr. Winter, has way more followers than I do, and she has reached millions and millions of people teaching about vaginal hormones and how they prevent urinary tract infection. I believe her work has saved 
thousands of lives. It, it's really quite incredible what one person can do on social media. Not just that, but social media has caused introductions to people like Mark Cuban. If you're all not using cost plus drugs uh, to get your free, your really cheap Cialis, I mean, you can get 90 pills of Cialis for five bucks or eight bucks or something like that. And so you must be using these pharmacies because CVS doesn't have these deals. Insurance is not going to cover all these meds that we want to give to our patients. So because I'm so loud on social media, I've been connected and I can DM with Mark Cuban all about the price of vaginal hormones. So much so that he's literally changing the world because a tube of estrogen cream is $20. When I got out of my training seven years ago, it was $500. It's $20 a tube. A tube lasts about two months for our patients. So you're talking access. Our patients have access to these life-saving medications, even if they don't have insurance, which is really Really absolutely incredible. So social media has been so important to get information out to a broad audience. Not only that, but the amazing American Neurologic Association has been listening. We yelled and yelled and yelled on social media and the AUA said, you know what? We should do a guideline for genitourinary syndrome of menopause because this is a urology problem. And when you do guidelines, the insurance companies start to listen. Hopefully the, um, uh, politicians start to listen because we have a lot of barriers and we got to have a lot of advocacy work still to do. So you, yes, social media can be full of otter videos and cat videos and a lot of trolls and mean people out there, but we have been able to make amazing, amazing change uh, through our work and our yelling and screaming on social media. So let's talk more about what GSM or genitourinary syndrome of menopause is. So hormones, Hormones is not a bad word. Hormones are not all good or bad. Hormones are just things in your body that serve a function. And we know as urologists and urology people, we have we play with testosterone all the time in our male patients. Testosterone helps for libido. It helps for urethral uh, health before, you know, if you're going to have a, a urethroplasty, you want good testosterone levels. It may help a little with erectile function. The jury's still out on that one. But we use testosterone because it has real effects on the sexual health and health of our male patients. Well, women have hormone receptors throughout their entire body. The bladder has estrogen and testosterone receptors, the bones, the heart, all of muscle, uh, the brain. It has lots and lots of estrogen receptors. And it's actually not women have estrogen and men have testosterone. We really need to move past that. Women actually have more androgens in their body than they do estrogen. Men have estrogen in their bodies. It's quite important for men as well. And so we all have different ratios of these hormones circulating throughout our bodies. And then when menopause happens, the average age is like 51 or 52, but it can start, the testosterone changes can start in the late 30s, in the early 40s. For all those patients coming in with urinary symptoms and UTI symptoms, but their cultures are negative, it's hormone changes, right? And just because they're still maybe getting their period, they may be having significant changes in their androgen levels or fluctuations in their estrogen levels that are causing these genital and urinary symptoms. And you may start to see this in the late 30s. Now, we may have actually people in their 20s having these symptoms because of things like birth control pills, which play with hormone levels. So anytime you play with hormone levels, whether it's through spironolactone for acne or um, uh, disordered eating, and, and pe people are not getting their period or women who are lactating who have very low hormone levels, we can see changes in the genital and urinary sim system because they're very hormone sensitive. And so a lot of times, you know, I said hot flashes and night sweats can happen, but it's actually so for a lot of people, they don't have symptoms in their late 30s or early 40s, but the bladder symptoms start happening in the 50s and 60s. And so our patients are not thinking about menopause because a lot of them, went through it a decade ago. And we as doctors aren't thinking about menopause because that, that's a gynecology issue. We don't have to think about that as urologists. And I'm here to say that we are wrong. We've been practicing medicine wrong this whole time, that we should not be just giving out antibiotics and anticholinergics, which by the way, anticholinergics can cause dementia. So, so we should be giving hormones to prevent and heal the urinary sy system so that it can maximally, um, be uh, fighting against infection. And so the urinary sim systems happen, sort of symptoms happen sort of much later. And when you have uh, infections and dryness and pain and all of these things, 
it affects your sexual health. So your if your vulva hurts, if your bladder hurts, if your urethra hurts, sex doesn't really seem too interesting to you. And so as we get later and later in menopause, we have a really big increase in sexual dysfunction, of course. And it's all because of anatomy, people. When you understand anatomy and how your body works, it makes sense for why it's not working. And if we educate our patients, then they will understand why a treatment, a lifelong treatment, vaginal hormones are a lifelong treatment, just like uh, sunscreen and seatbelts, as my friend Kelly Casperson always says, uh, uh, vaginal hormones are for life. And, and if your body is not making the hormones, you have to give it back and it is very safe to do so. Now we know that our body, is, that everybody is the same, right? Is we are homologs. So we all start the same way. You either get a penis or a vulva and these body parts are very hormone sensitive. So baby genitals don't look like grown up genitals because puberty causes a change in the system. System. So these organs are very hormonally sensitive. So we spend a lot of time in our practice. Uh, as I said, I started my practice two years ago and I didn't buy fancy ultrasounds or lasers. I bought 799 mirrors on Amazon. So as a urology nurse, if you can make one huge change on Monday, it's make sure you have a mirror in every exam room so that when your docs are examining the patients, the patient can learn with the doctor. They can actually show them what is going on, show them that urethral caruncle, show them the signs of genitourinary syndrome of menopause, because when you can see it, you can then understand what we need to do about it. And we should stop examining our patients like we're like a mechanics, right? A hiding under the hood and, and keeping patients away from their own body parts, right? Can you imagine hiding? If you had a knife in your hand, can you imagine going into the emergency room and then covering it because they don't want you to see what's going on because it's too disgusting? I mean, we have to have conversations about the men are looking at their penis. Why are we hiding the women from their own genitals? And these genitals are very hormone sensitive. So if you look at this tissue, it's very interesting, y'all. So this tissue here at the opening, this is bladder tissue. This is urology tissue. This is called the vulvar vestibule. So you've got skin of the labia, skin of the labia minora, and this tissue is the same as the male urethra. It is endodermal bladder tissue, and it is exquisitely hormone sensitive, just like the male urethra. And so I always say this, when you play with hormones, there are consequences, sometimes good and sometimes bad. So birth control pills, breastfeeding, spironolactone, uh, menopause, uh, anorexia, and breast cancer treatments can all cause pain and tenderness in this area. Y'all, if you ever have a doctor uh, or give a diagnosis of someone with interstitial cystitis and they haven't examined this vulvar vestibule, please remind them that they don't know what they're doing and that they need to examine fully the patients because this tissue is bladder tissue, which feels like bladder pain. And so if a patient comes in with urgency before your doc gets in there, say, where do you feel your urgency? And I bet you money, 80% of the people will point to their vulvas that it is here where they feel urgency not up by their bladders. Actually, very some do, but very few people because this is where our patients are feeling their urgency. So instead of throwing third-line therapies and anticholinergics or beta agonists to patients as first line, healing this tissue with hormones should be first-line therapy for OAB. It should be first-line therapy for any genito or urinary sy symptom. So frequency, urgency, leakage, the foundation is healing this tissue and fixing this tissue. And if you look at this tissue, there's not just estrogen receptors, but androgen receptors here as well. Androgens are quite important for this tissue. So GSM, genitourinary syndrome of menopause, is not just about sex, although, of course, it's dryness, pain with sex. You know, we minimize this for women. We say, oh, it's just a little vaginal dryness. Use some lubricant. But y'all, this is not a little vaginal dryness. This is life and death. This is urinary frequency so bad you get up 10 times at night and you break a hip and you die. It is urinary tract infections that are so recurrent that you need a pick line. It is frequency, urgency. It's dysuria. It's pain and burn 
turning of the vulva, vagina. This is not just a little vaginal dryness. This is very serious, very life-changing and horrible symptoms that we minimize and dismiss women. So many times they don't even come to the doctor or they come with their UTI and they just get thrown antibiotics after antibiotics, which do not fix the, the, the problem. So when you are answering those portal messages, when you are seeing that this patient keeps coming in, you got to nudge the docs and the NPs and PAs you're working with and say, hey, this is not okay. This person has GSM and we can actually save the day with education. We can save the day with them understanding why these medicines are so important. Hell, y'all can show them this video uh, and have me explain it to them, right? That's why I do this stuff because I believe you can save a life in that uh, portal message system. And so what happens is the tissue is thin, it's raw, it cracks, it bleeds. Many of our patients just stop having sex because there's just, why would you want to do something that just hurts you? And the pelvic floor muscles underneath get tight, they get tender, um, and they're really difficult to relax because they're under constant pain. If you have to look at one picture and I could burn it into your brain, this is what I want you to see. This is healthy. This is stretchy. This is acidic, which can fight infection. Lots of lactobacilli. This is a healthy microbiome on the left. This is what happens without hormones. It is red and raw and irritated. The opening, y'all, if you put in penile implants and the patient has a, 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 a partner who looks like this, your implant's not going to get much use because there's no place for it to go. So we must be talking to all of our uh, male and female patients about these issues because it's really important because as urologists, we take care of couples. And so fixing this is literally the most joyful thing that I do. So if you see here, right, you lose the labia minora in, in GSM. Y'all, if a penis shriveled up at age 52, we would have a vaccine, right? We're not talking about this. That labia literally shrivel up and disappear. The opening, this vestibule is red and pale. It's ear. We see caruncles and urethral prolapse. If you get pH paper, besides the mirror, this is the other really great thing I have in my exam room because you can show women how much better they can make uh, their own body. So when you can examine them. You take a vaginal swab and you rub it on this paper and it's going to be really uh, not acidic, right? It, it gets, uh, it's blue, dark blue. And when they use their vaginal hormones, it goes to four and a half, which is going to maximally protect them. It's also how you can tell if your patients are using their vaginal hormones. Because if they come in with UTIs, they say they're using it uh, and their pH is still bad, they're not using enough or they're not using it properly. So it's a really great tool to have in your exam rooms. This is that same patient. So this was her before vaginal hormones. You can see how red and irritated. This is her after vaginal hormones. She hasn't had a UTI in years, right? She can actually have penetration with her partner, which makes her very happy. And the data shows that using vaginal hormones, you can prevent infections by more than half, more than half. Okay, y'all. And again, I can talk about this all day long. So we have lots of options. Um, you know, we have tons of choices. And so if one doesn't work for your patients, many of the patients actually don't don't love creams, be, even though they're the cheapest. So creams, if it's all they can afford, then creams are the best option. But the creams can have chemicals in it, which can irritate the tissue for some people. And unfortunately, many of your doctors are instructing our patients the wrong way. They're saying, just use a little dab at the urethra. Just use a little dab. Now they can use a little dab at the urethra, but they should be using at least a gram every day for two weeks and then twice a week till death do they part, at least one gram. And one of the workarounds to make it not goopy is to really rub it into the tissue. Like if you put moisturizer on your face, you don't just glob it on, but you rub it in. And so why not just a dab? It's not enough to acidify the tissue to fight infection. And so it's really important with that pH paper that we show that we're actually decreasing the pH. So your dab of estrogen instructions, tell your docs that Rachel Rubin is judging them deeply and they need to use more. Now, if your patient, so the, the creams are the cheapest, they come with an applicator. They can put it on their finger, a gram, or they can use the applicator and they should really rub it in. And again, it will not start working for about two to three months. It won't work maximally. And it will only work if you keep using it. This is not macrobid that you can stop after five days. And so use GoodRx coupons or cost plus drugs for the cheapest option. I'm telling you, it's $20 a tube, which lasts about two months. If your patients hate the creams, there's these vaginal tablet inserts, which insurance often covers. And so it's every day for two weeks, then twice a week. I think these are lovely because the patient doesn't have to measure something out. It's not goopy. You set it and forget it. 
Now, remember, I said there's uh, androgens and testosterone uh, in the tissue that or the tissue wants testosterone. This is a product called Intrarosa. It's vaginal DHEA. It's fabulous, especially if patients are still having symptoms with the estrogen. This is a wonderful nightly product. It's a suppository that they use every day. Sometimes you got to do a prior authorization, but it is a magic, uh, magic thing that really does help that tissue at the opening, that vestibule tissue. For your, um, this is one that's a, a branded product called Invexi, rhymes with I'm sexy. Why? Because we help sexual function with these things. That's, uh, we use the 10 micrograms most often every day for two weeks, then twice a week forever. For your little old ladies in the nursing home who don't have much dexterity and can't put something in regularly, the vaginal ring, the E string can be very expensive. Uh, but if your patients either can afford it or you can do that prior authorization and get insurance to cover it, it's a fabulous, fabulous product. You can also get this on Cost Plus for about $500, but remember, it lasts for three months at a time. Now, there is an oral option. Um, it's a CIRM uh, called Ospemaphine that um, is quite, for the patients who really won't do something vaginally, um, it, it is a pill that you can take by mouth for this problem. I tend to use the more local uh, treatments uh, um, just because as soon as you go systemic, you can run the risk of other side effects. So some quick tips. None of your patients ever can fail vaginal hormones. You may need to change the, the product that you use in the delivery system, but these are foundational products that are really important. If you're like, you can then use your third line therapies. You can then use physical therapy. You can then use all the other things that you're doing, but this is the foundational product. You must be patient. It takes time to start working. The tissue does not regenerate overnight. The patient must use this forever. You can say, when do you stop brushing your teeth? When do you stop moisturizing your face? When do you stop wearing your seatbelt? For the patients who may be on systemic hormone therapy like patches and gels, you still want to screen them for GSM because it's often not enough. Sometimes you need more topical testosterone-based products at that vestibule if they still have symptoms. That's kind of expert level stuff. And the don't forget about their pelvic floor because sometimes you have to train the muscles and re and this goes for your male patients too. Sometimes you really do need to rehab the muscles. Now, um, I'm not going to go into all of the data here, but there are many videos of me talking about the fact that we really don't have to worry about safety. There is no risk of stroke, blood clots, heart attack, cancer, dementia, but the box says it causes those things because the box is wrong. It's wrong in actually killing people, which is why we need advocacy in the AUA to get involved because we have to change that box labeling. The box is based on oral hormones at very high doses that we do not even give anymore. And so we know that um, vaginal hormones in breast cancer patients show no increased risk of mortality. In fact, in this study with hundreds of thousands of people in it, they found a small decrease in death from the patients who use vaginal estrogen compared to those who did not. We have even more studies to show that there's no, in large claims database, that there's no increased risk of breast cancer recurrence in patients who use vaginal hormones. So vaginal hormones are safe in people with a history of blood clots. They're safe for a, a history of people with dementia. There's no uh, safety issues because these are not systemic products. They don't increase the systemic estrogen levels. And I've got millions of slides to show you that. So in conclusion, my promise to you is that if you nurses invest your time educating patients about the uh, importance of these hormones to prevent UTI and the safety of the hormones, you will save lives. If you find the right product and your patient with the patient to figure out what works for them, you will save lives. I promise you your after hours phone calls, your portal messages will decrease so much that your docs are going to give you more work to do uh, because now you're not answering so many UTI questions. And within two months, months of starting it, not only will your patients become believers, but their partners will love you and call you a superhero. But it's really education is everything. And who better to educate and save lives than nurses, right? This is treatment that is lifelong. This is not just about sex, right? This is about health. And um, uh, uh, it is about li living longer and living more quality of life. Here are some resources for papers. Again, use my social media and Ashley Winter social media uh, to help guide you and to help give you even more fuel to explain this to patients because you got to get your spiel down. And um, just thank you so much for having me. This really has been just an absolute honor and I'm happy to take questions. I have one comment. Wow. <laughs> it was really great. 
I, I, I love the point that you made about the social media's effect in this business because I think it's it's definitely changed our world. Sometimes not always for the good, mm -hmm. but a lot has. Um, one of the things I've noticed, even with Euro Nurse, you know, it, it's it's certainly targeted at the healthcare profession, but I could tell you a lot of consumers are watching this show. And it's, I, I know that because of the comments I get back from people asking questions. And I think it's, it's important that it shows that people want more information and that's, what's important. Now, uh, before we kick it off all the questions here, I'm going to just throw one of my questions to you. Um, so you were saying you spend more time with your patients and we all are dealing with this, you know, seeing 50 patients a day and trying to squeeze everybody in. Um, so what's your average time that you spend with a patient then? So I live in a fake universe that I've created for myself um, because I don't participate with insurance companies, which value care at, at very low dollar amounts, which is why doctors see so many patients an hour. So a new patient, if it's a virtual visit, it's an hour, If it and which is not enough time, I'll be honest. It's crazy, but it's not enough time. Um, if, a, it's a, if it's a new patient in person, it's an hour and a half because I had an exam and I'm like already wanting to make it two hours because it's not enough time. And so I see people, I take a really long, history, a really biopsychosocial history. I'm asking tons of questions. And you have to understand people are coming to me if they saw 20 doctors and they've had 30 years of pelvic pain or, you know, issues for so long. And it's funny, those patients who you all are like, oh God, this patient's coming in today, right? It's very stressful when those patients come in. They don't scare me because when you do give it the time and you can properly educate, then they actually start to make sense. And when you can get them to understand them and when you can understand what's going on, it's magical magic. And when you can fit them with that, because it's always, it's not just one person who fix it, fixes people. It's a team. It's always a team. The patients who do the best, they have the right mental health care. They have the right pelvic floor physical therapist. They have the right um, sort of primary care doctor. They've got a team. And I think this idea that patients only need 15 minutes of, of medical care once a year is silly. It's silly. It's really silly. So um, this is where nurses can actually play a huge role because the time and the education, you don't necessarily need the fellowship trained cancer surgeon to, to, to spend 30 minutes explaining vaginal hormones. But the, the, the doc can come in and say, listen, this is actually why I do social media. So the doctor can say, you actually really need this vaginal hormone product. Don't listen to me. My nurse is going to come in and explain it to you. And you should follow these women on social media because they're going to explain it fully and you're, it's going to make sense to you, but you have to do this. Like, so, and the more, what I find for patients, I love sharing. I say, don't do hormones because I tell you to do it because you've done your research. You've read the papers, you follow these other people on social media who agree with me. That's when the patients really get it right. Not just because one person says you must do this, you know, or you can't do this with your body. Um, it's when they do their own homework and they say, oh, this makes sense to me. I'm going to use this because then they stay on it. Right. When they don't understand it, they try it for a month and then they forget or they feel better and they stop using it. And when you don't understand it, you don't. And we call these patients non-compliant, Right. Which is just absurd. Right. It's not that they're non-compliant. It's who can become compliant hearing five seconds of information and getting a prescription that's going to cost the money every month, right? Why would they be compliant if they don't understand it? Right? Yeah, that's a good point. I, I do like your uh, uh, mention of the, the uh, Mark Cuban's pharmacy, because as, as somebody who recently started Medicare and uh, you know, the, the prescription plans that are out there really don't cover much of anything. Um, I was amazed that I could actually go to that pharmacy, to get my drugs, and it was costing me less through that than I was paying when I was on Blue Cross Blue Shield. Much less. And, and it's really Nothing. important to go on GoodRx and, and Cost Plus Drugs and look at all of your family members' drugs and do a price comparison because you can save tons of money, which is just a whole other problem. But they're actually, they have abiraterone, they have prednisone, they have blood pressure medicines, diabetes medicines. I mean, um, there's been research to show that if we just used, if Medicare just used Mark Cuban's pharmacy for urology medications, billions of dollars in savings that was billions with a b like yeah. it's it's just wild and think yeah. about it if if these people use 20 dollar s trace tubes the if you you could prevent urinary tract infections by more than 50 percent we would save medicare enormous sums of money right enormous sure sure yeah hey panelists any questions i'll let you go first 
I actually have a couple questions for you. Um, and thank you, Dr. Rubin, that was fantastic. And I'm 52 years old, so enough said. But um, what I wanted to ask is, um, do you ever use the cream like prophylactically? Like if, for instance, myself, if I'm not having symptoms at this yeah. point, would you put somebody on it just to prevent it? So I would, I'm incredibly aggressive and there's no harm. Adding vaginal hormones to your life, whether it's estrogen or DHEA, will only provide a healthy microbiome, will only keep the tissue strong, healthy, pink, lubricated. And, and, and to the point being of why would you want symptoms? Like you will develop symptoms of some sort here, right? Because the tissue is losing hormones, right? Whether we do yoga and deep breathe and eat clean, it's not going to prevent the fact that your ovaries are already not producing what they were 10 years ago. And so the question is really, why wouldn't you want prevention here? We wear sunscreen to prevent uh, sunburns, right? We wear our seatbelts to prevent getting hurt in a car accident. So I am very aggressive here of like, I believe prevention is absolutely the right strategy. Um, that being said, you probably have symptoms and don't realize it because we don't screen because we call this a little vaginal dryness, but it's not. It's that urinary frequency. It's the urgency. It's the, ooh, my keys hit the door and I got to go. It's the like, for a lot of people, it's, man, I like notice my genitals more than I used to. I used to never think about it, but like it feels a little uncomfortable. But as doctors, we don't we don't talk about it. We don't ask people about it. So for all your docs giving out Mirabegron and, and, and Oxybutynin and all these things, if you got to check that med list and be like, hey, doc, this patient is not on vaginal hormones, that's the foundation. We actually should start there. And then in two to three months, if they're not better from their OAB symptoms, then add, because you will find, because we even know third line therapies like those, those medicines, many people go off of them, right? It is not a very high continuation rate. I will give you money, like, like give it two to three months on vaginal hormones. And then it, if they still have OAB symptoms, which many will not, then you add it, they'll work much better. They're going to actually work, right? As opposed to the patient who gets the dry mouth and constipation and stops it. And so actually constipation is another great symptom of GSM that we don't talk about. I've seen people who they stop having sex because it was painful and their only GSM symptom is constipation because the pelvic floor muscles tighten and the stool can't get out. And so they're only, but the GI doctors don't know anything about GSM. So they're not picking it up. And so it's actually the urologist who sees the patient for a UTI, right? Or the primary care doctor who sees the patient. Like, like this is something primary care doctors should be doing, which is why I loudly also talk to primary care doctors. Um, it, this is like, everyone's missing it. They're missing it. Comp it's like this obvious elephant in the room and everyone's missing it. It's because we, because we have relegated all of women's health to gynecology, which is unfair, silly, makes no sense. And yeah. it's not fair to our gynecology colleagues. Right. Well, thank you. Um, my second question, what is the reasoning behind doing the daily for two weeks and then twice a week? Yeah, I think they'll get there if you just do twice a week, you know, if you don't want to make it complicated. That uh, initial priming, that's just kind of how these were studied as sort of initial priming dose to kind of really gear up the tissue and then kind of uh, decrease the amount. So I don't have a perfect reason. Um, I think, you know, for patients, if they were to just do twice a week, it just may take, you know, a little longer than two to three months to get that pH maximally lowered. But I really haven't seen any studies comparing. It would be a very cool study to do comparing using the dose the priming dose versus not using it. And if you get the pH benefits uh, at the same time period. Yeah, I was curious because a lot of our patients who start on it um, may not comply as well for, you know, doing it the two weeks. So we just end up putting it on the twice a week and I think they'll probably, as long as not just a pea size, as long as they're using that yeah. gram or the inserts, you're probably going to get there ultimately. But a really great a thing you could start on Monday is order that pH paper because that's yeah. how you prove it. I, it's such, it doesn't cost that much money. You get it on McKesson, it comes to you and it literally changes the game because not only can you be shown why they're getting better, but the patients can see it and they love seeing that their work is actually like getting, you know, like it's, it's real. It's yeah, really that's helpful. interesting. I had no idea about the pH paper. That's great. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's great. Thank you, Dr. Rubin, so much for such a great presentation. Um, I'll say not only do you exude knowledge, but 
so much, it feels like you are on the patient level, right? Um, on being able to have that conversation. One thing that I'm interested, um, you mentioned uh, you created your own little universe with your practice um, and you seem to be very active on social media. You also kind of mentioned that you tend to get those patients that people are like, oh, great, here comes that patient. How, how do your patients find you? Are they being referred to you? Are they patients that have seen lots of people and then they're like, eh, I'm going to try to find someone who actually understands me. And then they search you, find you. How, how do they get to you? Yeah. My patients are like, no one shows up in my office with a little problem, right? Nobody gets on an airplane and comes flies and waits six months to see me with a little problem. And so, but if you had seen this patient in your office, your docs, and you would look at this as a little problem. Oh, they have a UTI. Oh, they have a pelvic pain. Oh, they have a, an orgasm problem. Come on, lady, this guy has prostate cancer. He's dying. Who cares about your orgasm problem? But to our patients, these are not little problems. And so, and, and so these patients who get to me are incredibly well-researched, are knowledgeable. They're on the message boards. They're on Reddit. They're on Facebook. They're searching. They hear me on podcasts like this. And they're like, I want what she's offering. I want that. And so they get it. They invest in themselves and they come and they wait and they and they they get the experience. So it's it's um it they come and end. I have again um built my reputation up so that I'm sort of the I do the stuff y'all don't want to do. So if that patient comes with that really challenging case of persistent genital arousal disorder and you're like, I have no idea where to go from here, you tell the patient, hey, there's this lady who, who sees the weird and the wacky. She does the complex. She's sort of a sex detective, right? And then my name goes out there a lot. So a lot of people use my social media as a way of like, hey, and it's okay if you don't know how to do something, right? For We, ne we didn't learn how to do, you don't have to know everything, but you have to be empathetic and listen and validating and say, hey, this is a real thing that you have. Men who come in with hard flaccid syndrome, it's real, right? It's just then getting them to the people who are interested and researching. And, and we don't know everything about hard flaccid syndrome, but we have enough patience and enough experience and we could talk to these people at a very validating level to say, here's the toolbox that we've, you know, that we have. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, absolutely. Thank you. Um, that's great. I'm really happy um, always when it is that we stumble upon uh, professionals such as yourself that advocate so much for patients and that really inspire nurses to do the same, right? I love to think of nurses as patients advocates. Um, it is often, right, where whether a patient is overwhelmed or, you know, they don't have a clinical background. So sitting with the doc, talking a lot, it, it's a lot. And then they'll call the nurses afterwards and you get to spend, you know, more time, um, with them afterwards. And I, I personally, um, really enjoy that, you know, being able to help the patient connect the dots, um, and be an advocate themselves for their own care. What y'all do is so important. And I cannot, I literally cannot be any more clear. You can save lives here, like a lot, not like a small number, like the nurses have the potential to actually do this in a big way because you're getting those UTI requests, you're filling those antibiotics, you're the ones who can change. Like, I'm actually getting like really hyper just thinking about it of okay, how do we reach more nurses? How can we make this go viral to every nurse in every primary care clinic, to every nurse in every because I actually think I've been doing this all wrong and like I'm going after the docs, it's actually wrong. I should be going after the nurses. Good and point. so maybe the three of you can help me figure out how can we literally go door to door because this actually is the thing that changes the world. And, and so I, I'm pretty excited about this. Um, like this, this is pretty important stuff. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm lucky in our group to actually did embrace uh, estrogen cream early on. And we were getting those patients that you saw the the the, the cycle. I've I've seen my primary for urinary tract infections. They they walk in asking for an antibiotic because that's what they're used to. That's how they're treated. And we're like, well, wait a second. There's this, something else we should be trying here. And all of a sudden, they they, they disappear. Away. They they're disappear. Just, <laughs> they're, they're not coming in anymore. And you're like, the next time you see them, they're like. Oh yeah, I've been fine ever since. I've never had another infection. I mean, that's that's really powerful. It's huge. And again, it's so easy and it's easy enough to not do it. It's so easy that everyone's missing it. 
That's the crazy part. Is it feel like it feels like, oh, we must be on, we should create a vaccine. We should create a, you know, we need like years of antibiotics. We need all these things. It turns out this answer was simple and there all along, it's the education that was missing. Yeah right? It was the education, which is where nurses can come in in a big way, because it's not enough that you write the prescription. They have to pick it up. They have to be able to afford it and they have to use it forever. That's education, right? Sure. And affordability yeah. was an issue because it was a huge issue. And, yeah. and you know, that is now Medicare. Gone. And you got to, you tell somebody it's a, you know, it was like a hundred dollars a tube and they're like, it was I, $500 I a tube. When I got out of training seven years ago, it was $500. Tube. Yeah. Now, so, and the problem is a lot of your docs still have that mindset that it's $500 a tube. And so it's not, it's $20 a tube now. And so again, the education piece, we have to be able to learn new things. And as yeah. you know, some of your docs are, are a little stubborn at learning new things and learning new spiels and things like that, especially when it comes to women's health, right? It's not always as sexy and fun and shiny and full of technology. And so it's, it's, you, really have to push on this one. I did have a pre-show uh, question come in and I'd like to run that by you. Are there any supplements you would recommend to take to help with urinary frequency and feeling of incomplete bladder emptying in premenopausal female patients? So are there any, you know, yeah, so, so my take things? on, so, so my answer is always foundation. The foundation is vaginal hormones. So these are the patients and it's perimenopause, right? Even if you have a patient with these symptoms and they're actually, you can use this in premenopause women too. It's not dangerous. Like you can't hurt someone with vaginal hormones. I just want to tell you that loudly. You cannot hurt anyone with vaginal hormones. Occasionally a yeast infection will pop up. They treat it, keep going, right? Right. So, so you can't hurt someone. So there are no supplements. First of all, the supplement industry is not even regulated. So there's not not even any proof that what's in the supplement is actually the thing. There are no supplements with any good data to show that they are as good as vaginal hormones. So those are the patients, vaginal hormones, so vaginal estrogen or DHEA, pelvic floor physical therapy, that's going to help the patient much more than any supplement will. That being said, are some of the third line therapies, OAB medicines helpful? Sure, I'm not against them. It's just foundation. Start with the foundation and then put the furnishings on. And so, but no, there is no supplement that I will endorse to say, oh, you don't need hormones. You need this supplement. Um, it doesn't exist. And there is no data. There's no probiotic out there that's proven to acidify the vagina. There is no, you know, a boric acid that's proven to acidify the vagina. So we're literally fixing, use language that, that patients understand. We are helping your microbiome with vaginal hormones. Vaginal hormones are the only essential oil that you actually need to keep the tissue strong and healthy, right? Meet them where they are. Get them to understand this is the most natural form of anything you could ever use because your body wants wants this so badly and it was making it, but now it's not making enough of it. And so we're just giving you back what your body in a bioidentical way so badly wants. All these products except Premarin are bioidentical products, right? So you're putting natural hormones back into the body. They're FDA approved. They are safe. So it's really just like an education thing, right? Yeah. Good we have point. a question um, from Susie Swain. Do you think that if they developed more hormone pills, women would be more likely to take it versus a vaginal cream? Well, so we've got pills. We've got um, inserts, right? We've got the DHEA, which is a suppository. We've got the Invexi, which is a little suppository with a little um, lubricant in it. We got the rings. And so we actually have a lovely toolbox um, that we can use for these patients. And so it's, again, it's finding the right product. And then as the nurses, really figuring out how can we um, come up with systems in place so we understand the prior authorization process. We understand what it takes to actually get these products in the hands of our patients. And so if it matters to you, and it should matter to you, because this actually would save lives, right? If it matters to you, then you will take time to do it. If it doesn't matter to your practice, then you're going to just like not think about it, say we don't do prior auths for that. We don't care about this. But like, it, it, it's the same like five products. So learn about them, Tr you know, start with one and then add, if you need to add others, be like, oh, this isn't the only option. And then you can really help that patient through through the different options. Yeah, it's yeah. a good point. I agree. Nurses are are the ones that often suggest to their doc, "Hey, have you tried this?" Or or they say, "Well, do you know there's this product out there?" Because, as you said, not everybody takes the interest that you do in in this field. 
And and, yeah. and that's right. And so it's okay for you to actually know more about this than your doctor yeah, to absolutely. say, hey, I heard this lecture by Rachel Rubin. They'll be like, who's Rachel Rubin? Be like, you don't follow Rachel Rubin on social media? <laughs> and then like, you know, you'll get me a follower out of it. But, but A little shame you, never hurts. Shame always is the answer. But you, you know, again, you actually will know more about this after watching this. You know more about this than your docs were taught in their schools. They weren't taught this. So yeah. it's not their fault. They don't know. But you know what? They can learn new things. And if you can get them to listen to this on a car ride, they'll get it quickly. It is not complex information. It makes logical yeah. sense. It's just nobody explained it to them. And so give that, put this in their ear and then you can do what, then you'll be, they'll say, oh yeah, give them whatever they want. And you can kind of really take this over and you could actually document this. And I would love for you to actually study this. And I would love you to put my name on the paper, but like you could literally look yeah. at your inbox for like UTI consults and calls and then three months months later, look at it again. And I guarantee you with the right education, you're going to see a total shift, right? Give it three months, but you're going to see a total shift. Cause I'll tell you, I run my own clinic. I do not have, sure. You get UTIs every now and then, but I don't have a clinic. I don't have a UTI clinic. I don't, I do not have people calling me all day, all night, all weekend. It just doesn't exist because they are all on vaginal hormones. Yeah. Well, you know, one thing that I thought was really interesting with this last question, um, you know, would one think that perhaps compliance on that hormone usage would be higher with pill versus cream? And it got me thinking a little bit, you know, how many patients have I encountered that had to teach female patients, older female patients, sometimes actually even younger, that I had to teach uh, how to do self-catheterization? And there is a little bit of kind of that modesty, shame, women don't know about their anatomy. And it's kind of a, you know, no one talks about it. Do you even know you have a urethra? I'm not going to talk about my sexual life. So I almost wonder if in a way, you know, it's almost like, oh, a pill. Yeah, everybody takes pills for all sorts of things. But, you know, putting and rubbing a vaginal cream there that just uh, is that connected perhaps to some individuals with some, uh, I don't want to do that. You know, it's kind of Absolutely. a, a shame and, you know, I don't want to talk about my sex life. It's okay. I'm getting old and things which is like why, that. Which is why it is our job to make this about urology and urinary yeah. health, right? I don't care if you're a nun, you have GSM and you <laughs> right. need vaginal hormones, right? I don't Absolutely. care. And so it, it's education. And again, like the more we stop hiding under the sheet, the more we stop accepting the fact that like, ooh, these are lady private parts. We're not supposed to talk about these. It's education, right? If we don't educate our patients, we can't force someone to take vaginal hormones. But when they understand, like when they, like UTIs are no freaking joke, right? Mm -hmm. Like, like when they're getting their fourth UTI and they're hospitalized and it is a little tablet that they can put in twice a week, a tablet, they don't have any creams and that can prevent a hospitalization that will kill them y'all, this is something worth like looking into, right? Like this is, this yeah. is something absolutely doing. Our patients put in rectal suppositories if they need to, they do all sorts of things. It's education that gets them there. And so again, the, when you show up confident and explaining to them, that's why the mirror can be so like the mirror can be a really helpful gateway of educating. This is your labia majora. This is your labia minora. This is your urethra. Just like you look at your face. Eyebrows are super weird, right? But we look at them like, why are their hairs above my eyes. It's super weird. But like, we have to move past like the, the genitals need to be a neutral place. Because the yeah. fact that they're shameful and guilty, like that's society, that's not reality, your elbow gives you neutral vibes, your genitals should give you neutral vibes. And so you yeah. we have to fight against that. And so the genitals can give our patients orgasms, their partners orgasms, human life actually forms from that part of the body. And yet our patients are disgusted by it. They're mortified by it. Like that's so messed up. And that's yeah. where we come as educators to call them out on it and be like, really? Like maybe neutral. Can we go for neutral here? Like right. this yeah. is why you can't wear yoga pants. This is why you can't make it through an entire movie. This is why, right? So not listen, I've been doing this now a long time. When you give people knowledge about how their bodies function and work, 
right? They make excellent healthcare decisions, right? When men understand that Viagra and Cialis are just muscle relaxers, they can make excellent healthcare decisions of whether or not they take them. Yeah. When when they understand why ICI, intracavernosal injections, will help them get the erections that they want, they can get over the mind drama of putting a needle in their penis, right? You So it's all education. And we do a really crappy job of explaining to people how their genitals work, right? And then we increase the shame and the fear and the and the judgment when we have that sheet and we're like mechanics and we only make it worse. Yeah, I honestly had never thought of that, right? And I'll, I'll be the first to admit that whenever I talk to patients about using their estrogen cream, I have a pamphlet right here with a picture and I'm like, oh, this is what it looks like. This is where you go. And well, duh, everybody's anatomy is so different. Yeah. Why would we not want to use a mirror Show them. and say, you know, Show them on their own body? Exactly. Yeah. And make sure you get enough estrogen cream in the canal. So so you got to get it in the canal, not right. just on that area at the opening. You got to get it in the canal and get that pH paper because it'll prove to you that maybe you're a little subtherapeutic on uh, because a lot of them are rubbing it on their labia majoras, which is skin, and it's probably not penetrating. Right. And so you probably aren't getting enough uh, of the good response that you want, not for lack of trying, just sure. for the education piece. Yeah, no, that's great. Well, this has been a great discussion. We are coming to the end of our show. So I am going to uh, uh, put a plug in for next week's show. Next week, we have a great talk on is the elimination of Caudi even possible with a new device? The opportunity to eliminate catheter-associated urinary tract infections is here. This revolutionary approach has shown great promise and ongoing success for both inpatient and at-home use. Clinical trials are currently being conducted and international demonstrations are ongoing. The opportunity to help eliminate catheter-associated urinary tract infections will significantly improve care and personal well-being. Join us as Dr. John Milliones takes a deep dive into this issue on December 9th on Euronurse.com. Okay, well, we hope for everybody to join us for next week's show. And I would like to just, again, thank panelists for showing up and Dr. Rachel Rubin for what a great talk. I think this is a great subject. And we'll see everybody next week.